Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Street, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Clinton Foundation. And we are so pleased to welcome you uh, here today to the Clinton Center as we celebrate Women's History Month with a very, very special program. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton School of Public Service, Southwest Power Pool, Simmons Bank, the Little Rock Convention and Visitors Bureau, and the City of Little Rock. Let's give them all a big hand. You know, here at the Clinton Foundation, we do all our work through partnerships. We call them partnerships of purpose. And we are truly grateful that all of these organizations continue to invest in one-of-a-kind programs that we are able to offer all of you here at the Clinton Presidential Center. I'd also like to thank the parents, the educators, the troop leaders, and the chaperones who have made it possible for all of these young people to be here today. Thank you all. I'd now like to ask Barbara Sugg, the Vice President of Information Technology and the Chief Security Officer at Southwest uh, Power Pool, one of our terrific sponsors here today, to come to the podium to say a few words and to introduce our special guest. Barbara. Good afternoon. I thought I might be a little starstruck. I am. <laughs> Not that I've been stalking you or anything. But I thought I might be a little bit nervous, so I wrote my notes down. I hope you don't mind. The cool thing about this is a magic notebook. For those of you children, especially, you probably run out of pages in your notebook, and you have to get another notebook. This one, you can just put it in the microwave and erase it. After you upload everything that's on it using a special app, to your computer. It's pretty slick. The, somebody solved that problem for me, and I'm so grateful for problem solvers. And that's a little bit what I want to talk to you about today. So my name is Barbara Sugg. I am the Vice President of IT and Chief Security Officer at Southwest PowerPool. We've got a good, wonderful contingent of Southwest PowerPool staff up here today. We operate in West Little Rock, but we function across a, a very large section of the United States providing services to utility companies and ensuring reliability. We're, we're sort of like air traffic controllers for the, ele for the bulk electric grid. We have been solving problems for 75 years. Uh, we just celebrated our anniversary a few months back, and one of the things, some of the problems that we try to solve are, you know, making sure that power gets, gets delivered where it's needed, um, all these new renewable types of power like solar and water and um, wind energy and things, they need to be connected to the power grid as well so that the power they produce can be delivered to the houses and the, the cities that need it. And so that's one of the things that SPP does. We solve problems every day, and we work with our members to solve those problems today and in the future. And what I'm super excited about is the children that are here and the parents that are here with the children, because it's the children that are going to be solving the problems that we don't yet even know that we have yet. But you guys are going to be our problem solvers of the future, and the way you're going to do that is you're going to study really, really, really hard and you're going to learn about these different STEM careers and, and education areas like mathematics, especially. Hidden figures is, there's so much about mathematics and engineering in there, but the, the main thing that I thought was most interesting about it is it's about problem solving. There's a lot of people problems that are, that are introduced to us in the book, and those are real problems that people work together to solve, but there's also technical problems and engineering problems and mathematical problems. There have been a lot of problem solvers right here in Arkansas. Walmart, Walmart probably leads the industry in solving problems in the retail industry, problems whether it's controlling their inventory and now they've developed technology where they can just drive a truck right through a gate and it reads everything that's on that truck without them having to open the back door. That's a pretty impressive te technological solution that they solved. They, they even have special equipment in their stores that automatically adjusts the lighting for um, saving energy when there's enough light coming in through their skylights. So sometimes you might go in there and you, you notice it seems pretty bright in here, but if you look up, the lights are off. That's technology that Walmart developed, and they've really revolutionized the way that they can use those solutions to save money, to do things more efficiently and reliably. 
And there are a number of other problem solvers that come from Arkansas that are really famous. Freeman Owens is from Pine Bluff, and he revolutionized the, the movie industry by putting sound with the video, so we didn't have to have just silent movies like we had before. Paul Klitsch revolutionized the audio industry with his speaker technologies. And Ray Montague, I just only recently stumbled across Ray Montague, but I cannot wait to meet this woman. I mean, she made such a difference in the Navy industry, not industry, but in the Navy as a whole, with her computer-generated ship design. Her first big assignment, she's given a month to complete this, to solve this problem. She solved it in less than a day. I mean, this is somebody who is determined, she is educated, and she is a force to be reckoned with. And we should all aspire to be able to solve those kinds of problems and make that sort of difference in the world. There are a lot of great opportunities through all of the universities in Arkansas. There are also a lot of wonderful needs and companies here in Arkansas that need these problem solvers. Southwest Power Pole is certainly one of them. We employ lots and lots and lots of engineers and mathematicians and computer science people. There are lots of careers here. The education system is, is phenomenal. And many of the, of the um, women that are introduced in the Hidden Figures book hail from Arkansas and were educated in Arkansas at what is now University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. It's very, very impressive what is going on here in Arkansas, and I want you to take note. You don't have to leave Arkansas to get that education and to get those wonderful, long-lasting jobs and be problem solvers. The mathematics background teaches how to solve problems, how to think analytically, how to think logically, how to sort of put your arms around what problem you're even trying to solve. That's what math is. I promise you kids, you are going to do math the rest of your life. For those of you adults who've been through algebra, you know, you will agree with me, you will solve for x for the rest of your life, <laughs> that elusive x. Back to the book and the movie, Hidden Figures. What a blessing and an honor for the Clinton Foundation to have uh, Ms. Shetterly here today. The, her story, her facilitating the stories of all of these phenomenal people is such an incredible opportunity for all of us to learn from. And without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Margot Shetterly up to the stage to give us a talk about it. Thank you, uh, Barbara, for that wonderful introduction and um, for those words, which I think we should all um, really take to heart about problem solving, um, you know, and that each one of us has the capability of solving problems. And I think that's a great way to kick off um, this presentation because that's what these women did. They were problem solvers. Um, thanks to everyone who has come here today. I really appreciate your taking time from your spring break to spend this time with me. Um, and thanks to everyone at the Clinton Foundation and all of the sponsors who, uh, who have brought me here to, to spend this time with everyone. My book, Hidden Figures, is a story of many things. It's the story of World War II. It's the story of the Cold War and the space race. It's the story of the civil rights movement. It's the story of women's push for social and economic equality. Um, and it's the story of computers. But back in 1943, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, when my book first starts, uh, a computer wasn't the electronic gizmo that sits on our desktop, that's in our phones, in our cars, in our coffee makers. A computer was a job title. It was usually a woman who spent her days doing things like classifying stars, calculating artillery tables, optimizing the shape of aircraft wings, and yes, eventually calculating the trajectories that would carry humans into space. But mostly Hidden Figures is the story of four black women, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Christine Darden. And Christine Darden was still a college student um, when Mary, Christine, and Dorothy, uh, who were portrayed in the movie, were doing their work in the 1960s. So that's why she's not in the movie, but she is in my book. Um, and all four of those women worked as professional mathematicians at a place called the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory, which is the kernel of what would become NASA, the space agency. 
Now these women, like the other women that they worked with, were extremely good at math. They were college graduates, and they had worked as teachers before coming to Langley. <clears throat> now over the course of my research, I have come to consider these women some of the best teachers that I have ever had. Um, I want to keep my remarks brief because I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions, but what I'd like to spend some time doing here today is sharing some of the lessons that I have learned from these women, not just from their work, but also from their lives. And I'm talking mostly to the students here. I think these are, these are wonderful things that you can learn from these women. First of all, you have to set your expectations high. Now, the black women in my story, they grew up during the time of Jim Crow segregation. They went to segregated black schools. And in fact, the law of that time made a, an assembly of this sort, a gathering of people from a diversity of backgrounds, difficult, if not impossible. The black schools were often overcrowded and falling apart, and the lessons were given using old, secondhand, or even third-hand textbooks. R. R. Moton Farm, uh, High School in Farmville, this is where Dorothy Vaughn taught before she came to the Langley Laboratory, it didn't have a science lab and it didn't have a gymnasium. She held class in a small open auditorium that was about half the size of this room right here that had as many as three classes being run at the same time. Just think about that. But while the law might have said that her students weren't as good as the white students across town, Dorothy Vaughn demanded no less of her students than my teachers demanded of me going to school in integrated public schools in Virginia. After teaching a full day of math classes, Dorothy Vaughn stayed after school to tutor kids who needed extra help in math, and she also directed an after-school choral group, which won several statewide competitions in Virginia in the 1930s and 40s. Now, she was the kind of person who found a mistake in a math textbook and wrote a letter to the company suggesting that they fix it. And that is actually a true story that her daughter told me. And in fact, the textbook company sent her a letter in return saying, thank you very much. Now, when she was in her 50s, in the latter part of her career at NASA, Dorothy Vaughn, like many other former computers, she learned how to become a computer programmer. She taught herself to do Fortran programming. She was still eager to learn the skills that would make her more valuable at work. She always tried to maintain her standards above the circumstances, as opposed to allowing circumstance to drag down her standards. Two, never allow fear to get the best of curiosity. When Katherine Johnson's daughters were young, they asked their mother if she would like to go into space like the astronauts. And she replied without hesitation, absolutely. She said, I want to see what's out there. Katherine Johnson always chose curiosity over fear. And choosing curiosity over fear, basically that was the job description for people like Katherine Johnson and the engineers and the mathematicians and the scientists that she worked with there at the Langley Laboratory. Using their minds and the tools that were available to them, and in the beginning this meant slide rules, mechanical desktop calculators, paper and pencil, they converted blind fear of the unknown into quantifiable risks, which allowed them to dream intelligently about how high, how fast, and how far they could fly. Now, of course, the women that I write about, they put curiosity before fear every single day that they went to work. In the 1950s, Mary Jackson was working for Dorothy Vaughn in Langley's segregated West Area Computing Pool when engineer Casimir Sarnicki recognized her talent and recommended her for an engineer in training program. The program required taking graduate level math classes after work at Hampton High School, which at the time was still segregated. The city of Hampton had to give Mary Jackson special permission just to walk through the doors of the building so she could attend class. Now, it would have been easy for her to give in to fear, to say, what if the city denies my application? What if the instructors treat me diff differently because I'm a woman or because I'm black or both? What if no one will sit next to me at the classroom? And perhaps the worst fear of all, what if I am not good enough to compete with the others 
white and mostly male in my class. And I'm sure we can imagine the kinds of fears and doubts that went through Mary Jackson's mind as she was considering her future. But Mary's determination paid off. She was granted the permission to attend the class. She aced all of her courses. And in 1958, Mary Jackson was promoted to engineer. Now, she became one of only a handful of female engineers at NASA, and she may have been the only black female aeronautical engineer in the entire United States at that time. By not giving in to fear, Mary opened the door to a successful career doing research on supersonic airplanes, and she also put, her, put herself in a position to help the women who came behind her. Three, it's important that you find something that you're willing to fight for. When Christine Darden was in the early days of her career as a young engineer in the early 1970s, she noticed that men who were hired at the same time as she was, with the same education and the same credentials that she had, they were getting promoted and getting the chance to work on their own projects, where she and women of all backgrounds were getting stuck in the computing pool. They were taking orders from the engineers, doing the computing for the engineers, but they didn't have a real way to advance in their own jobs and do their own research, which is what she wanted to do. So eventually she went to her division chief. And now the division chief was her boss's boss's boss. This is the big boss. And she went to him, she went into his office to ask about this discrepancy. And what he said to her was, well, no one's ever complained about it before. The women, I just assumed they liked it that way. <laughs> so uh, she clearly did not like it that way. Um, and that was a really bold move for a junior engineer, a junior employee like Christine Darden was. But that was the beginning of her career taking off. Um, what happened is that the engineer rewarded her for her initiative, and he said, I'm going to put you in the engineering group. We're going to see what you can do. And that's where she started writing a sonic boom program, a sonic boom minimization software program that became the industry standard and still forms the basis of how we look at sonic boom minimization, which is a very specific kind of supersonic flight program. That innovative research uh, kicked off a career as an internationally recognized expert. And she became uh, you know, one of NASA's top aeronautical engineers. Four, you have to remember, you are no better than anyone else, and no one is better than you. Over the years, Katherine Johnson has probably been asked more times than even she can count, what was it like to be a black woman in a mostly light, white workplace? What was it like to be uh, a, a woman in a predominantly male workplace? I've asked her that question many times. She has been interviewed over the decades, and people always want to know what it felt like and what gave her the confidence to do the work that she eventually did. And more often than not, what she says is, it's really simple. And of course, you know, Katherine Johnson, when you get to know her, she's the kind of person that you're sitting there and you're, you have no idea how she solves these problems. And for her, she says, it's really simple. Um, but when you ask her that question, she says, it's simple. It's like my father told me and my siblings when we were little. You are no better than anyone else, and no one is better than you. Since she told me that phrase back in the very beginning of my research in, in 2010, I've spent so much time thinking about it. I probably spent more time thinking about that one idea than anything else in my entire book. Um, it's such a simple concept, and yet it's very profound. It's a really powerful idea. Um, and it brings together a lot of the ideas and the ideals that we find in systems of philosophy and in religion. You are no better than anyone else, and no one is better than you. Now, the second part, that no one is better than you, I think that's what gives us the power and the confidence to walk into any situation. And regardless of our background, we, we get to feel like an equal to the people around us. But I think it's the first part that you are no better than anyone else. That is the part that is truly transformative. Because that means that 
each of us, no matter who we are, each of us is in possession of some of the most valuable things that one person can give to another person. Tolerance, patience, forgiveness, kindness, the benefit of the doubt, a sense of shared humanity. This means that you can allow other people their mistakes and their shortcomings, and that you can afford them to sp the, the space to accommodate your shortcomings. It means looking for the best in other people and assuming that others can and they will, given the right circumstances, that they are able to also see the best in you. No matter that you may be from different countries, different cultures, different races, genders, even political opinions. Katherine Johnson made a daily practice of this insight. Um, that she received from her father. I consider it one of the greatest gifts that I have ever been given, this, this bit of wisdom. People have been recognizing her mathematical brilliance since she was a child, but I think it's also the, her embodiment of this teaching that makes her such a hero and is also responsible for her success in life. Finally, you have to take the long view. Dorothy Vaughn was working in a laundry room in a World War II military base to make extra money during her summers off as a teacher when she applied for a job at the Langley Laboratory. Now, she thought she was accepting a six-month war job, and she found a career that lasted decades. Katherine Johnson was born in 1918. That was a year after the federal government established the Langley Laboratory, which is celebrating its centennial this year. In August, we're going to get to celebrate Katherine Johnson's 99th birthday and also the opening of a new NASA building there at Langley, which is called the Katherine G. Johnson Computational Facility. Statistically at birth, a black baby girl born in 1918 had a 2% chance of finishing high school and wasn't expected to live to see her 35th birthday. But Katherine Johnson went on to co-author the report that laid out the orbital equations for John Glenn's 1962 space flight. When Katherine Johnson was a college student back in the 1930s, one of her professors spotted her talent, and he said, I'm going to prepare you for a career as a research mathematician. Katherine said, well, where am I going to find a job? He said, well, that's your problem. My job is to prepare you so that when that job comes available, you are going to be ready. So it took her 18 years after she graduated from college to find that job, which she eventually did in 19, the early 1950s, working for Dorothy Vaughn at the Langley Laboratory. And the rest, as we know now, is history. 100 years ago, in 1917, the year before Katherine Johnson was born, the United States established something called the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory, my hometown, Hampton, Virginia, which is the reason why I know about this story. And their job was to design better airplanes. There was no way for that first group of employees, there were 11 people who started out at that laboratory in 1917. They had no idea what the future held in store. Not one, but two world wars, jet engines, nuclear weapons, planes that could fly faster than the speed of sound, vehicles that would take humans to the moon and back, and maybe even most improbably, the fact that women mathematicians, including a group of black women, would be a necessary part of sending those astronauts into space and bringing them back to Earth. So I ask of you, the students in this room, what do you think is possible in the next 100 years for science and technology, for your city, and for our country? And for those of you still in school, just setting out on your path through life, what do you think the next 25, 50, 100 years is going to look like for you? What kinds of problems are you going to have to solve? What memories will you share when you're Katherine Johnson's age? Will you, will you have developed a propulsion system that allows humanity to make safe and regular voyages to outer planets like Jupiter and Saturn? And interestingly, I found a research report that was dated 1970. Back then, Katherine Johnson and her colleagues were already thinking about this. They had written a research report with trajectories of how we might get 
take a trip to Jupiter and Saturn. And so I'm convinced that there's probably someone in this room right here today that's going to stand on the shoulders and look at that research of Katherine Johnson and figure out how to get us there. So just think about all of the problems and all of the fascinating things that you're going to have to confront in your lives for you younger people. And for us older people as well, you know, there are challenges out there for all of us. Well, you've written a poem, maybe there are artists and writers here. Well, you've written a poem so replete with truth and beauty that future generations will know its cadences by heart. Or will you have multiplied your own gifts by becoming the teacher who inspired a legion of younger scientists, of artists and leaders? There's no way for us to know what the next century has in store for us, but one of the greatest lessons that I learned from writing and researching hidden figures, and this is also something that has been very true of the lives of Dorothy Vaughn, of Mary Jackson, of Katherine Johnson, Christine Darden, and all of the other women that they worked with who used their mathematical talents in the service of our country and of science, is that even the most momentous of journeys begins with the first step. Thank you very much. And at this point, I'd like to call for questions. Well, thank you so much for sharing those really inspiring stories and I think lessons that we can all take away uh, from this incredible presentation today. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to take a few questions uh, from the audience, uh, but I'd like to start out with just a few. Your, your book dealt with many relevant social issues uh, of the time. Which did you consider the most important to share? Wow, that, that is a really hard question because there are so many issues um, that in one way or another, um, were affected the lives of these women and that I was able to tell through the lives of these women. So I, I don't know, it's sort of like choosing a favorite child. Like sometimes <laughs> people say, well, which one of the women was your favorite? And I, I love each of these women in, you know, so much for the things that they brought. Um, it's, so it's, it's really hard for me to pull them out because I always saw the narrative mm -hmm. as um, uh, sort of a, a piece of woven fabric, you know, that had all of these threads that, that depended on the other and right. um, where there was an issue, like for example, um, the civil rights movement, the long civil rights movement. So uh, A. Philip Randolph, who uh, people used to know his name and we don't know his name as well now. Um, he was really somebody who's, who offered his shoulders for Dr. Martin Luther King to stand on. Um, a. Philip Randolph pressured F uh, Roosevelt to open civil service jobs to African Americans. Um, and so there we have during World War II, so that we have this connection between the civil rights movement and World War II. Mm -hmm. You know, World War II was a time when women of all backgrounds started flooding into the workplace and doing jobs that had previously only been open to men. So we have the confluence of World War II and women's issues. So it's, it's, it's hard so for me. There's right. so many. And I, for me, it was always both the challenge and also the goal to bring all of these stories together um, and to do it through the eyes of the, the protagonists of the book. You obviously did a fantastic job. Um, growing up near NASA's Langley Research Center, when did you first realize the significance of these women's work? Uh, yeah, you know, I so I grew up in Hampton, Virginia. That's if you guys have seen the movie. Uh, that's although it actually was filmed in Georgia. It is Hampton, Virginia in the movie. Um, and my dad is a research scientist. Um, he's an atmospheric scientist who spent his whole career at the NASA Langley Research Center. And I knew these women because they also worked at NASA. There was, you know, this whole kind of group of people who worked at NASA. And, you know, uh, the Hampton Roads area is a place where there's a lot of defense industry. There's NASA. There are two shipyards. There's a lot of military. And as a consequence, there are a lot of technical jobs, engineers and things like that. So these women um, were part of that. They got up, they went to work, they worked at NASA, and it seemed like no big deal. Um, and it was really my husband. Um, we were visiting my parents. Uh, six years, it was Christmas in 2010, so more than six years ago. 
And uh, my dad was talking about some of the women who did this work that he had worked with, um, you know, and very casually. And, you know, and Katherine Johnson, and she calculated the launch window for the astronauts. And my husband's <laughs> eyes got big like saucers. Like, you know, I've, I've studied a lot of history, and I've never heard this story. Right. And, and why is that? And, you know, for me, who grew up knowing that these women worked at NASA, I realized that I didn't really know the story. You know, why was it that they were there? How did they get there? What were they doing? You know, I know they worked on uh, that there was space, but before that there were airplanes, but I didn't know very much about that. And so it was a moment in which I got to look at the place that I had grown up and the people uh, who were my neighbors um, and look at them in a different way and, and to get really curious about their lives and how their lives really set the stage for my life. Thank you. Can you tell us in what ways you personally identify with these incredible women? Yeah, you know, I, I, I really, there were times when, um, you know, even though this book is a work of nonfiction, like if you look in the back of Hidden Figures, you will see the pages of notes and documents and articles and um, photos even, phone books. I mean, you know, I, I really, uh, tried to pull together every shred of documentary evidence that I could to, to pull these women back together. Um, it, it's also a work of imagination, you know, and um, part of the imagination was being able to put myself into the position of these women and understand what they may have been going through or, or felt like, you know, there's, there, there really was a lot of imagination that was required. And um, so my, my background is that I, you know, I uh, went to college, I went to the University of Virginia. My first job was as an investment banker. Um, and so I knew in, in a very different era, obviously, but there were many times when I was perhaps the only woman in the room or the only African-American or African-American woman or the only Southerner in a room full of Northerners, you know, I mean, all kinds of different things that, that may make you feel not as confident or, you know, and, 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 or, or the youngest person in the room sure. and having an idea and having to say to your boss, you know what, I think you're wrong. Um, you know, there are were, there were situations like that that although uh, a lot of time separated my experience from the experience of these women, there were circumstances where I had been in, in similar situations and could imagine um, what they had gone through. Um, and, you know, I think also being somebody who loves their work, who loves to work, you know, and gets a lot of identity from work, as these women did, um, and was ambitious, you know, I understood the ambition that they had to, uh, to move up in their jobs and to do an excellent job. You know, there, there were a lot of things that, um, as a professional woman, I very much identified with. Great. Well, let's now open uh, up for questions. If you will raise your hands and please wait uh, till one of our volunteers brings you the microphone. And if you'll uh, stand up when you ask your question, please. When did you first start to see yourself as a writer, and how did that evolve? That is a very good question. Um, it's, it's really interesting. So my father is a research scientist, and my mother is an English professor. So I always had, I think, these two influences um, you know, from the time I was a child. But I, I always, in terms of work, always assumed that um, I would be kind of an analytical person, you know, and, um, and, and, you know, my father was very disappointed that I didn't become an engineer or a scientist, but, um, you know, I spent a lot of time, you know, as an investment banker, which is kind of an analytical profession, and then worked in um, internet media and as an entrepreneur, so a lot of very uh, careers that were, that are analytical first, but also tremendously creative. Um, my husband and I started an English language magazine. We lived in Mexico for 11 years, um, crazy entrepreneurs, and went and started an English language magazine um, for expats. There are a lot of Americans who um, have retired and live in Mexico. Um, 
and they don't speak Spanish, but they you know, want to know about the, the country they're living in. So we're like, wow, this seems like a great business idea. Um, and there, it was a, an even more, you know, I guess, balanced uh, combination because on the one hand, starting and running a business is kind of an, uh, like an analytical thing. But I wrote for the magazine, you know, and, and edited writers. It was this really, uh, that was really, um, I guess, as a professional writer, that, that was a really important thing. Um, but as, you know, I would say it was really after I had the book of Hidden Figures in my hand um, in September, when I finally felt it was, I could say to myself, I am a professional writer. You know, I think it, it takes a long time to think of your, to inhabit whatever it is that you're doing and to take ownership of it. And it really was having that physical book in my hand and seeing my name on the front that I said to myself, wow, I am actually a professional writer. Another question? When you, whenever you reach, research somebody, was there somebody that you connected with on a personal level? Do you mean of the, of the different women in the book? Like or? If, if you research, because I remember you saying something about talking to their daughters and stuff. Yes. Um, so um, of the four main women in the book, Katherine Johnson is still alive. Uh, Mary Jackson and uh, Dorothy Vaughn are no longer with us, and I didn't. I I did get a chance to meet Mary Jackson um, because she worked with my father, but I didn't get a chance to interview her for this, um, and I didn't know Dorothy Vaughn uh, and Christine Darden, who is you know in the end of the book, she's just 75 years old, so she's you know she is very active and speaks a lot, talking about STEM careers, so. Um, but I did get a chance to spend a lot of time with Katherine Johnson and also with her family. So it was great to get her firsthand stories um, of, of what her life was like and what her careers were like and what that moment was, for example, when John Glenn said to her, you know, uh, said to the engineers, get the girl to check the numbers. You know, I got to interview her about exactly like when did it happen and how long did it take you and what kind of calculating machine was on your desk then and you know so even though um in a lot of circumstances um i didn't get to talk to that firsthand person the same way i did with katherine johnson you know i told i got to talk with for example dorothy vaughn's um daughter who told me that story about her mom, you know, finding the, the mistake in the textbook and sending the letter so they would fix it. Um, and the other thing was, NASA has been very good over its history of doing interviews with people who either are still working there or had a whole career and have retired and asking them about their memories. So there are a lot of people that I didn't get to talk with personally because, you know, perhaps they've already died. Um, that I still felt like I had a conversation with because I got to read their interviews and their memories of what it was like to work there in like 1945 or you know 1962. So um, the personal connection and really doing more than just looking at the documents, but really getting people's, their firsthand story of what it was like to work there, that was a very, very important part of my research. So thank you for that question. Can I ask you a little bit of a follow-up to that? Because I can't imagine how just amazing it was to hear, like you said, from Katherine Johnson firsthand about her stories. Did she ever tell you again about just sort of the tremendous pressure she must have felt, especially when you said John Glenn mm -hmm. said, get that girl to do the calculations. How did she get through that? I mean, I cannot imagine the whole world, the whole, now all of NASA is depending on you. Did she mm -hmm. talk about her feelings or just the pressure, what it must have felt like and how she got through that? Yeah. Well, the first thing to remember is that this was all teamwork, you know? So everybody had an important role to play. Katherine Johnson had a very important role to play, but other people had important roles to play as well, and they worked together. So, you know, another thing that is really important about this, this, this story and this work is that it's really important to know how to work with other people and to work in a team. 
And, um, you know, when I asked her that question, she said, well, listen, everybody had their job. Um, everybody knew that the success of the mission, sort of like a watch with a lot of different parts, you know, the success required every single person really doing their job the right way and, and making sure that every part was excellent. So everybody felt this pressure. You know, there was individual pressure, but there was, you know, the group together, you know, felt a group responsibility and a real sense of shared mission. Um, but, you know, when I asked her, it's like, you know, so when, <laughs> when you were sitting there and, you know, you guys are actually watching this mission that you have, have done numbers for, for years, actually taking place, you know, here is a man's life in your, in the hands of your numbers. Um, were you guys nervous? And she said, oh yes, we were very nervous. <laughs> so she, she was prepared, you know, they, they knew that, um, they believed in their ability to do this work, and they knew that they were bringing their A games, but there was never a question that this was also extremely high stakes and that uh, a life was on the line. Absolutely. Other questions? Right here. When you sat down to write this book, did you expect it to be as big as it is now? I, I really, um, I had no idea. <laughs> Uh, the thing about it, the thing that I knew was that um, it was a good story. Anytime when I asked people, uh, where people asked me what I was, you know, what this story was about, and I told them, they were always like, oh my God, I've never heard about that. That is amazing. You know, the response was always very positive. Um, and uh, it just, it just kind of kept snowballing. Like, you know, each day was sort of like more energy and more interest. And, um, Ultimately, I think I was writing the book that I wanted to read. You know, I wanted this, you know, this story, this great American adventure story with, you know, the space race, like all of these things that you learn in school. And I wanted those protagonists that I knew and who looked like me. I wanted them to be the ones leading the story. Um, but I really, you know, everything that has happened from the movie to, um, you know, to the tremendous reception for the book, to, you know, to being, to being invited here today to come and speak with you, you know? I mean, all of this has been just magnificent beyond my wildest dreams. Um, but, you know, the thing is that I'm most grateful about is that these women who did this tremendous service, um, amazing service uh, to science and to our country, that they are now getting the platform and the, the enthusiastic, uh, you know, cheers that I believe they deserve. And how wonderful uh, for Katherine Johnson to be presented with the Medal of Freedom by President Obama. Did she talk about that with you at all? That, uh, what that felt like? Yeah, you know, she, she is, I mean, the thing about, you know, I think this is another thing about Katherine Johnson that makes her so in, just incredibly compelling is that she is so gifted and yet she is very matter of fact about her own gifts. And uh, these things happen that you're just like, oh my God, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. And she's like a little bit like, well, what's the big deal? I was just doing my job. <laughs> um, so, but I think, you know, one of the things that, um, that she has said um, about her own fame, and I think at this point, you know, we could really kind of call it fame, um, is that it, it's not so much about her achievements individually, but it's her achievements also shining a light on all of these other women who did the work and have not been recognized. Such important lessons for ourselves and for our kids to really understand the real history mm -hmm. um, of our country. Other questions? Oh, okay. Right here, Barbara. <laughs> So your first book, and it's on the New York Times bestseller list, which is incredible, an incredible achievement. What's next for you? You are working for my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the thing that, uh, one of the things that, you know, among just the like more lessons than I could even, you know, talk about that I learned doing this and from these women. Um, but one of the things that I really learned is that there are amazing stories everywhere. I mean, there are absolutely fascinating people 
who are uh, very humble and very quiet and that you see, you know, every day for 30 years or whatever, and then you all of a sudden find out that that person has a story that is so remarkable that it will change your life to know it. Um, and the, but the thing that is amazing is your life can be changed like three times a day, every day for the rest of your life because there are so many stories out there. So um, there, were, there were many stories that I found that I discovered um, doing the research for Hidden Figures. And for whatever reason, this period, this mid-century period, you know, the American 20th century of World War II and civil rights, and, you know, so many things changed and so much of what we think of as modern America and the modern world kind of was fused out of that time period. Um, so there are uh, several more stories that I'm interested in. Um, there's a couple that I'm, I'm just starting to um, kind of push forward. Uh, and each of those stories also has these African-American protagonists, um, mid-century stories that really deal with issues of work and identity and social mobility. Um, and the way Hidden Figures really deals with science and, and NASA as that sort of transmission for um, work and identity and, and these questions. Um, the other, the next one really focuses on entrepreneurship and finance and um, business as the, the scene um, in which all of these issues come out, but with fascinating, fascinating protagonists. I mean, there's so many people who have lived just stupendous like lives that you just say to yourself, I can't believe I've never heard of that person. And um, you know, so that, that's my next project. You've very much piqued our interest. <laughs> <laughs> Over here. Yes, ma'am. Um, how did the movie come about and how much involvement did you have in them taking the story from the book to the screen? So one of the, the, the uh, most frequently asked questions is, how could the book and the movie come out at the same time? Because the book came out in September and the movie came out uh, in December. The reason is, um, I right after the book was accepted by the publisher, which was about three years ago, um, it was in March of 2014, um, my literary agent through this, there's this whole network of people who are interested in finding books that might make a good movie. Um, and so my literary agent got the book into that network of people who got it to someone, who got it to someone, who got it to an agent that finally landed on the desk of a woman named Donna Gelati, who was the producer for um, Hidden Figures. And so Donna had my book proposal. It wasn't a book. It was still a book in progress. And she got this 55-page book proposal in which I you know, outlined what I wanted to write about and kind of a sketch of the book and the characters. And so she read it. And um, she called me up. And I was in, in Virginia, actually, doing research at the time. And she said, listen, I just got this book proposal. And we're going to make a movie. You know? And I was sort of like, listen, I haven't written the book. Like, I am still writing the book. And you were talking to me about a movie. I mean, like, who, who are you, right? And it, it, it just happened that she was an Academy is an Academy Award winning producer. She did Shakespeare in Love. She did Silver Linings Playbook. She'd worked for Miramax for a long time. I mean, she's one of the most successful uh, producers in Hollywood and one of the most, you know, notable female producers who really identified with the story of these women. Um, and the thing is that, you know, everything that she said to me on that first phone call came true. You know, the only thing that she said to me on the first phone call, and this is really kind of the kind of person she is, that did not come true, and it, just by a smidge, is that I am going to win my next Academy Award with your book proposal. Uh, so, but everything else, Absolutely, in terms of the timing, the kind of people that we are going to the Oscars. She's, you know, all of these things. Like, she really was just, she believed in that story and her ability to transmit the passion and the importance of that story to other people. She was a champion for that project. Um, and she's really the reason why the movie happened on the timetable that it happened and happened with the kind of resources and attention um, that 
that it that it eventually uh, garnered. So um, so another lesson is you know if you you need to find the champions. Like if you have a job or a passion or something that you want to do and you find a champion, you know, somebody who's willing to make that project and your success part of their job, then you are so much more likely to achieve that success than if you're doing it by yourself. You're so right. Champions and mentors, especially for all the young people here today, are so, so very so important. important. Yeah. Did you get to go to the Oscars? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go to the Oscars. Um, Katherine Johnson, I don't know if you guys saw the Oscars, but yeah. Katherine Johnson was there. That was and uh, that was pretty amazing because um, she is, you know, she is 98, almost 99. She is frail. Um, so the producers sent a private jet to wow. Hampton, Virginia. And um, it, this was a really big deal, as you can imagine, in Hampton. Um, she and uh, her daughters and, and several grandchildren all flew out from Hampton, from actually the airport in Newport News, the next city over, um, to Los Angeles, and she was able to attend the Oscars. Um, so that, that was a, you know, like an absolutely jaw-dropping moment to see her so gorgeous um, there with the, the three protagonists of the movie on stage. It's very, very exciting. Question over here? What were your goals after you finished the movie and the book? That is an excellent question. Ah, uh, so, well, this, I would say the biggest goal that came out of that entire process, um, other than eventually to get some rest, <laughs> um, <laughs> The biggest goal that I have right now is to write another book and to do it better than I, than I was able to do Hidden Figures. Like to really learn everything that I did um, from writing Hidden Figures and figure out how to turn that lesson and to, to do an even better job this time. That's my goal right now. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, what advice do you have for um, others that are interested in writing a book? Uh, I would say there's, you know, there, there are a few things I would say. First of all, you should write as much as you can, you know, and the thing is today there are a lot of places where you can write. There are blogs, there are, you know, um, magazines, like there are city magazines. There are a lot of places out there who need that need writing, and you know, so you should you should write as much as you can. Write in a journal, just write, write, write. You should read as much as you can. You know, if you're not spending a lot of time reading, um, it's much harder to be a good writer. Like you should absolutely think about the kind of writer that you want to be, and read those kinds of things and see how other people that you think are really good writers. Uh, do their work and learn from them. Um, the other thing that is just really important is you have to, you have to be comfortable with the fact that your writing in the beginning may be bad. <laughs> it, it may be, it may not be very good. It takes, like writing is rewriting. It is truly the fact that you write and then you rewrite and you rewrite and you rewrite and you rewrite. And, you rewrite. and at some point you can get something that is good, but it, it may take a long time and it probably will hurt, <laughs> um, like, like anything, you know? But if you know in advance that it's gonna take a lot of work and eventually you will get there, I think that is one of the most important things. If you saw the, um, the draft, I put it in quotation marks, of what eventually became Hidden Figures, you would be like, there's no way this, this person is going to get from here to there. You really would have said, I, I just don't think it's possible. Um, but you, you know, you get up every morning or, you know, you stay up really late at night for whatever reason, like the best writing that I do happens between like midnight and four o'clock in the morning. I wish it were not true, but it is. <laughs> and um, eventually you will get there. So do not be discouraged if what is on the page is not the idea of what you think should be on the page. Just keep going, you know, it, it'll take time. But I promise you, if you rewrite enough, you will absolutely get there. 
Margo, thank you so much. Thank you. Really on behalf of um, everyone here at the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton School of Public Service and the National Archives, all of our Clinton Center family, we are just beyond grateful that you made the time to be with us today and share the incredible stories, the inspirational stories of these women. Not only have we enriched ourselves by hearing about them, but it's so incredible to know that our country has such a deep and rich and diverse uh, history, and it's so important that we unearth more of these stories. So we are very excited uh, for your next project and hope you'll come back once that is finished and share that with us too. I would love to. Thank you so much and for having you, me And thank you, Barbara, here. and thanks to all of our tremendous sponsors that allowed us to bring this program today. Thank you all.